they used a free fibula to reconstruct the segmentary gap in the bone and took off the external fixator and plated both ends of the fibula to the radius and the humerus so these were uh, late outcomes of the same uh, lady and this is the uh, arc of motion uh, of the finger flexion and extension uh, of course the elbow is fused and does not have any motion Uh, i also find that uh, if you are aiming for both extensor and flexor reconstruction we should do the flexor reconstruction first it's like scoring a touchdown in american football while extensor reconstruction is scoring the field goal after the touchdown thank you thank you sandeep for that uh, very interesting series of cases and the take home message is very very relevant at each point of time uh we don't have any question as such in the q and a for your talk right now a uh, couple of questions from my side uh what, what do you think is the is the most ideal time for your secondary reconstructions you showed the each case had different timelines but given a choice what would be the correct or the right time for you to go in as for secondary reconstruction i i think the bone fixation and the skin cover should be done at at the initial setting and both uh, I, i feel that the either nerve or the muscle tendon unit reconstruction should wait till the soft tissue is settled so typically that is about 3 months and then i would stage it across so if the first setting i would do the nerve and one of the muscle tendon unit reconstruction and then come back to the second stage for the if it requires both extensor and flexor reconstruction i find that therapy wise it's difficult to adhere to a rigid protocol of therapy when you have to train both extensor and flexor side at the same time so i think 3 months and then i give a 3 month gap it, uh, so the patients work on the therapy and they are ready for the next stage okay and uh, in your practice what do you think is is a very or the most important complication which might affect your outcomes eventually you you talked about uh, <coughs> infections in couple of patients mm-hmm. right so do you think that so, is the most important aspect so in uh, uh, in our pack uh, we are a level 4 trauma center but most of the patients are trained seen by trainees so we, we would usually have a registrar so i find that the initial debrimo is inadequate because uh, they are not confident of the reconstruction so the debrimo actually becomes lesser and i think that is what leads to all the complications uh, i keep telling them that it's okay to remove if you are not sure it's better to remove it instead of waiting for it to demarcate because you lose time and the wound gets infected but that decision typically needs to be made by a senior uh, or an experienced person and that delay which the junior person uh, they are just uh, being careful in singapore we have a word called kiasu which basically means afraid to die and uh, so uh, every behavior is directed by that especially for muscle etc so i think we just need to be uh, aggressive and it's important for us to be there to show them how it is to be done i i think that that stems from where you're trained basically like is it a predominantly orthopedic unit or is predominantly a plastic unit where the extent of debridement you know that the fear of you know taking away what is required and coverage i think that inherently comes from probably that that training right from day 1 i guess i don't know hari you have any comments on that yeah that's correct <clears throat> so that's what we say as an orthopedic training your aim should be a sinus free wound healing and as a plastic training your aim should be a stable bony fixation or a bony healing so when we work with these aims in mind we always have a combined approach because any wound can be covered and any bone can be fixed so it's if we think about each other then i think it makes a good partnership yeah no i know that uh, from my experience with you that's why i wanted your comments on that uh right uh one of the bugbear of hand surgery is edema uh, especially when these patients come late sandeep what's your protocol for that i mean especially i think that that uh, you know uh, the outcomes rely heavily on that uh, when the patients have gone through the initial a uh, stage of recons i mean debridement and everything and they come to the secondary stage that transition period yeah uh, 
I, I think the, the initial edema is because of inadequate debrimo and there is some low grade infection there. So I think uh, we need to get rid of that. And secondly, you should delay the surgery till the edema is resolved. Because there's no point doing uh, some tendon or muscle transfer and you can't mobilize them because of the edema. So I think you should just wait till the soft tissue is settled. There's no uh, real hurry to go ahead and do this. Uh, it just becomes uh, for the sake of doing it, but uh, the, uh, the, it doesn't reflect an outcome. So I think we just need to wait for that. Okay. Uh, there's one question in the Q&A, Sandeep. Uh, Prof. Sandeep, salvage every case. Do you salvage every case? When will you say it's a hopeless case? <laughs> so what's your end point where you say, okay, this will go for an amputation versus you continue salvaging the case? Yeah, so I, I think your, your aim is to try and get a prehensile hand. That means that you, you need to have a thumb in, in, in a position of a thumb and fingers uh, that can oppose to the thumb. It doesn't, need the, doesn't mean the thumb needs to move, but that hand needs to be useful. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, the cases I presented didn't have any hand injury. They were all uh, forearm extensive flexor muscle loss. So uh, if, if you cannot get a, a hand that works, then I, uh, I think the decision is quite easy. It may, be, it may be preferable to do that. But you don't need to make that decision on day one. I, I, I think it's uh, sometimes you need to give it some thought. Uh, it's rarely that mangled. So it's important to debreed everything, assess all the spare parts, put it all back, then go back and think whether something is possible. Uh, uh, revascularize what is re re required and then uh, take it off. Uh, over, overall, the upper limb requiring amputation, it has to be really mangled. Uh, usually, we can salvage to give it some sort of function, which is usually a stiff thumb and at least one or two fingers to oppose to it. I think that's a, that's a reasonable goal. I, I think that's the overall message of this entire webinar itself, is not to give up on these hands. So that's very, very important. Uh, so... Once the reconstruction is done, I think uh, not just at that point of time, but even earlier, I think uh, the most important person would be somebody who would rehab these hands uh, right from day one, I guess, in, in, in a very subtle sense. I would request uh, Donald Pitts to start his lecture on uh, the rehabilitation of these mangled hands. Yes, sir. I want to say it's an honor and privilege to have the opportunity to, to be here tonight and to, to speak with you. I really appreciate the, the, the opportunity. My disclosures, North Coast Medical, been with Toyota for 28 years, Hand Therapy Foundation and Hand Therapy Certification Commission. Kentucky basically has bourbon, basketball, horses, and Toyota. And I've been a consultant for the, the U.S. Army uh, Center for the Intrepid for the last 12 years, teaching trauma to the U.S. Army and Armed Services. My mentors, Ralph Herms, was trained by Dr. Reardon and Dr. Brand, and they were trained by Sterling Bennell, and then I also was trained by Dr. Peter Murray, and Mark Lindsay was with um, Dr. Kleiner for 25 years. So the goals of therapy and, and, and uh, is basically to restore functional use of the hand. It must be aesthetically pleasing uh, as well as functional that, that exceeds a prosthesis. Functional outcome prognosis is driven by severity index, age, the type of tissue, location of injury, the cognition of the patient, the psychosocial factors, and the social support is extremely important. My case study tonight is with a 40-year-old um, a pulmonologist, uh, right-hand dominant, left-hand injury. He was at a social event, and his hand uh, got caught into a uh, meat saw. He had a transmetacarpal replantation injury with extreme vascular nerve injury. Father of two children, his primary goal is return to work. We had to review the chart, uh, operative report, x-rays, and actually start planning for a discharge. We use a standard uh, trauma planning sheet that helps us kind of outline and define what, what is working, what's not, and, and plan the orthotics and treatment approach and uh, timelines, expectations. Patient education. Right off the bat, uh, our uh, doctor was extremely educated, but we still need to educate him on activity modification to slow down, um, to uh, help him uh, regain his function, stay off the caffeine, and eliminate any smoking um, that he would do. Wound management, extremely important. 
Um, you know, there's no cookbook answer for these these injuries, and despite uh, the shared wound healing characteristics, each structure is unique, particularly when the wounds are uh, untidy and uh, have extensive injury, um, which can uh, complicate the matters. This this situation, uh, the wound was untidy uh, with uh, with the meat saw. And so it, uh, we were constantly worried about two things: one, infection, and two, we had a very, they had a very hard time hooking up the per, the, the the blood supply. So um, his hand was very um, teetering on on avascularity for for quite a while, uh, for about 10, 12 days. But we we pulled out, uh, and it worked well. Hand therapists have a unique skill set. Uh, in that we understand how all different types of tissues heal and the timelines they heal. So once we understand what's been fixed we can start applying stress uh, and maximize their functional outcome. And so uh, the inflammatory phase is obviously prolonged with these types of injuries uh, because of the excessive edema, the loss of lymphatics, and the loss of superficial veins. Uh, this is a, a picture of before and after selected debridement. And we just basically go in and take off uh, the uh, the dead. This is a we started debriding him. This is about a ten day picture, and this is the before and after picture of the debridement. And we gained quite a bit of MCP flexion extension just by changing um, and taking off the uh, the dead tissue, which is a big plus in moving the edema around and and stopping the scar mechanism from occurring. Um, you know, monitor the color closely. I mentioned uh, the uh, the uh, vascularity patency. So, you know, when you have an arterial insufficiency, obviously the limb is going to get white and cool. So lowering the hand can help help with that problem. Venous insufficiency can get the, the hand can get blue and tense. And so elevation may help. But the, the rule of thumb is to basically put it in mid-range at, at heart level. Um, and uh, but that's it's a hard task to do for patients to follow. Next is edema management. And here, uh, you know, elevation is key uh, and good elevation and monitoring elevation and, and how the tissue responds. Active uh, exercise and active range of motion and getting the hand moving as soon as possible. What can move, move it. Beware of compression. We don't use compression gloves or compression devices till you're about six weeks out. Uh, and we really guard it with thermal agents unless the we have a uh, good uh, or decent um, sensory feedback loop. Pain management. We use greater motor imagery. We use 10 units on the median nerve distribution that has 80% of the autonomic fibers to help control the chance for autonomic flare. And we start stress loading in the maturation phase as soon as possible, uh, assuming that everybody's going to have CRPS at one level or another, and we treat it before it occurs. Here's an example of greater motor imagery. Uh, here that we're retraining the brain's pathways um, to reestablish motion and, and keep the pathways open. I really believe in uh, uh, using uh, this particular modality, which really helps with pain and helps with uh, fear and anxiety. Early protective motion. First question you have to ask, well, does fixation impede movement? What can move? What can't move? And when we figure that out, then we can then we can really uh, go after uh, corrective orthotics and go after uh, assistive devices to help the patient move. So passive range of motion, key here. Move slow. Hold it in range for at least 10 seconds. Beware, if you move fast, the finger's going to bounce off uh, fabric bias that's there from swelling. <clears throat> Few repetitions, uh, up to 10, four to six times a day. And there's no studies that tell us what are optimal doses. We just kind of have to see how the tissue responds and move forward. But again, move slow and controlled and steady and hold it in range to maximize your range of motion. We also have early... Uh, Pass the range of motion. It starts at uh, four to 14 days, and I'll show here. So it's active wrist flexion, passive digital extension, and then wrist neutral and passive MCP flexion. Remote tinny glide, active wrist flexion, passive wrist digital extension, followed by wrist neutral and pack. So it's active wrist flexion. All right, and then early passive range of motion uh, two, um, we started 14 days, roughly, depending upon the tissue healing, but uh, an example of this. Early passive range of motion two is wrist and neutral, MCP flexion, hook posture, bring the fingers back down, and then PIP flexion, no greater than 60. Back up. 
early passive rain? Those are critical to start early tending glide and and uh, start the uh, and activate the edema pump. We also start uh, muscle uh, muscle stem DC current for both the flexor digital profundus and FDS uh, at about the uh, depend upon the repairs between four and six weeks post surgery. Orthotics. Early orthotics are critical uh, in this stage to protect healing tissue and position and, and prevent deformity. You can see his first orthotic that he had was basically an orthotic to protect the healing tissue, putting his hand in a safe posture uh, and letting the tissue kind of heal and, and, and to diminish the stress on the tissue. But as we changed, um, here we're showing a picture of Time Magazine, the replant, uh, and this, this is the orthotics that we make for replants. And we use the same orthotic on uh, on patient M. We start him out with this orthotic as a crane orthotic uh, that only applies about 300 to 400 grams of force to the tissue. It's safe. You can start early motion. You can see he starts real early motion. This is uh, started at uh, at day 10 post surgery, uh, and uh, you start an early slow pump that allows you to st actually stimulate the muscle spindle apparatus in the forearm and not overstress the the structural repairs of the tendons or the arteries, the nerves. And you can see that as he progresses, that his hand starts walking out more and more as his edema uh, changes, and we start increasing the force through the splint. Uh, but it works extremely well. I learned this orthotic from a guy named Stephen Chesser back in 1991. We lost Stephen about 15 years ago. Uh, but bottom line is, uh, it's a great orthotic to be used for a lot of different types of, of um, high-level injuries because you can control the stress on the tissue. This is a good, a better example of a different patient, but a better example, you can see that uh, you have a force controlled uh, from the top outrigger, but you can actually, uh, the static straps to the finger, you can control the force regulation through the hand and do different hand postures. This gentleman uh, lost his owner artery and in in the tip of his owner from a horse bite. The bottom line is you can use it for a lot of different pathologies and start early motion. Motion is the key to controlling edema, controlling scar, and getting a better functional outcome. Yes. You can see now that we've progressed to the orthotic now being more elongated and having his hand open more to increase his aperture for picking up larger air, uh, larger objects. Here he is about, uh, he's now at about uh, Nine, nine to 10 weeks out, he's got a smaller hand-based orthotic so he can be in the clinic and see patients. Uh, and we're controlling his, his uh, motion with small finger splints and hand-based splints. We also used orthotics to place a low load, long duration uh, stress application uh, through, his, uh, through his MCP joints for flexion and then a static progressive strap to pull his hand down into flexion. Uh, but uh, the orthotics can be a great ally to assist uh, in correcting uh, dysfunction and increasing gross grass potential. And the last orthotic that we use for this gentleman uh, is a corrective orthotic. This is not this is not the patient, but the similar splint. Uh, we had an orthotic that we basically the nickname is a dinosaur, where you actually apply force through the wrist flexors and slowly walk the digits out and, and elongate the extrinsic flexors to maximize their force potential and aperture potential. Last but not least is functional activities. As we all know, the brain and the hand has a very unique uh, connection. We know that we have when we have amputations that the fingers will fall off the amacus of the brain in as early as two weeks. So the quicker we can get the patient into functional activities, the better chance we have to, to maintain the brain-hand connection. And here he is starting early at 10 days, starting just picking up pegs with the fingers that he can pick up and use using the crane. I'm sorry, he's more, he's uh, three weeks at that point, and he's picking up pegs and doing things, engaging the brain, the hand uh, with uh, the orthotic on. And we also used uh, different types of functional activities like sewing. This is a different patient. This is a, a flexor tendon patient, but again, showing that we do different activities to facilitate motor control uh, with uh, patients. Here's a strengthening activity that he was doing to work on his thumb. As the doctor mentioned earlier, the thumb and the ability to at least have two good digits working uh, with the thumb gives you maximum function, uh, at least a good functional hand. Let's see, he, this is early in his process. He's about two weeks out here, but he's already starting to use his thumb and his, and his small finger together. 
we have a plethora of, uh, of activities we can do to increase strength, dexterity, motor control that we use in the clinic. Um, here he is at the final stage. He's back to work. He's a full-fledged pulmonologist. His DASH score is less than 10. He's happy. He's productive. And he's doing all kinds of different functional activities. Uh, so when one has a little, a little, when one has nothing, a little is a lot. He's got a, a functioning index finger, a functioning thumb, and he has gross grasp with his uh, middle ring and small finger. So we also focus on one-handed ADL tasks during the acute care phase and adaptive equipment if needed. Take-home points, there's no set protocols here. It's all problem solving and communication with the doctor. Duration of treatment is normally two to three hours of treatment, three, three to four days a week. Don't overlook the psychosocial components. Almost all these potion, patients uh, have some type of PTSD that occur either early or late in the rehab process. Patient education is critical, not only to avoid uh, uh, caffeine and nicotine activity modification, expectation and timelines to understand what the treatment timelines are now, what future surgeries can occur. Use orthotics to protect healing tissue and correct tissue to maximize functional outcomes. Active early treatment of edema is extremely important with range of motion and elevation. Proactive stress loading is critical for, for CR, for, to avoid CRPS. Scapular stabilization programs are critical to treat the entire kinetic chain and use functional activities to retrain the brain and the hand together. This is the last uh, case. I've seen this gentleman while we were decorating the graves in Memorial uh, Day at, uh, this past year, and uh, it's an interesting case. It's a trans uh, metacarpal um, complete amputation occurred in 1982. Turn it for me. Big fist, squeeze. Uh, harvester cut the hand off, um, and he was flown uh, from Berea to um, Louisville, Kentucky, where Dr. Coots uh, replanted his hand. Please. What was your occupation? What'd you do? Farmer. Farmer? Yeah. How much, how much uh, what, tobacco and cattle farmer? Yeah, a dairy farm. Dairy. How much uh, how much use did you get back in your hand? You about, what, what, what can you not do with your hand? What do you have trouble doing? Nothing. Because I've been a rural mail carrier for 30, going on 34 years. 34 years, rural mail carrier. Yeah. How about the sensation in your hand? How, how's the feeling? Well, I, if I hurt it, I can't feel it. But now I can feel you hold that on too. Yeah, you can feel me touch it, yeah. but it doesn't like hot and cold. You have some trouble. Yeah, yeah, I had to wear a glove in August on. August on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, All right, I'll I'll stop there. It's it uh, basically uh, just to, to keep in mind that it's um, that um, the um, reconstruction is essentially a salvage procedure, and therapeutic intervention should emphasize restoration of function, maximizing return to their social roles, and and help them realize uh, gainful employment and um, and fun in life. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you, ge gentlemen and people tonight, and I, I feel honored and humbled. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fitz, for that wonderful uh, uh, talk. I think the success story of uh, a mangled hand, I think, is based on one who sees first, but also you know, one they end up with, and ending up with a good therapist is very, very important. And uh, you know the, the motivation of the patient is so important when, there, when there's a good therapist with them. Uh, my question is, how early do you get these patients in your practice? Or what would you uh, prefer them to come to you? Or when do you prefer them to come to you? I, we, we normally see them uh, when the surgeons, when they release them from hospital, the, sur the surgeons feel they're stable. Usually we get them in, in the first week, between week one and week two. Uh, we start protective orthotics. And, and actually the dynamic orthotic at 10 to 12 days. So as soon as we have anastomosis of the blood supply and uh, we know what uh, bony structures are stable, we can we can put them in the orthotics and, and, and start functional activities as soon as possible. So watching closely the patency and the blood supply with, uh, with, uh, with stress. So that, that really is our biggest key with return to function, uh, get them in there as soon as possible. Yeah, I, I think in a very ideal setting, that, that would be a, a fantastic way of getting them at two weeks, but then that doesn't happen most of the times in most of the countries. Yeah, uh, I, I saw the mirror therapy there, the graded motor imaging, and we use that for CRPS quite often. And then uh, being used that in the mangled hand situation, I think it's very, very interesting. So do you find any difference between a CRPS patient versus a mangled hand, or do they have an overlay of CRPS in them also? 
we with the mirror we, with the mirror therapy what you were demonstrating yeah we we um we we kind of do, this is kind of what we kind of treat all of our patients like they have it therefore we we try to avoid stop forget it so we i treat it very early and it's one of the telltale signs that we see early on uh, you know, everybody talks about the trophy changes, pilomotor, pseudomotor, vasomotor, but the jumpy joint pain that we see. So when people start having pain uh, that are that occurs before the end range of a joint, that really is a telltale sign of an early CRPS or early um, uh, what we used to call RSD. And so we start treating them very early when we see that. And we start, uh, and we may start out with a very low level uh, stress loading program. We must be nothing but roll a ball or, or, or use your hand on a towel to start early low level stress loading and then just progress them into that. And also we found that that scapper stabilization that you can start very early by by attaching bands or whatever to their to their humerus if you can and starting low trap mid trap serratus work and controlling the scapula and keeping the scapula from becoming destabilized and becoming from being uh, uh protracted pull it back into retraction that actually helps with um with the neural su- neural supply down to their hand and blood supply down to their hand. If the shoulder sets in a protracted position, it cuts cuts off uh, the neural the, the nutrition from the nerve at the cell body, of the neck, and also cuts off the blood supply. So keeping the scapula retracted really helps with uh, with the diminishing those symptoms. Um, and, I, and that plus cardiovascular. I didn't talk about this in the talk, but we get them on a walking program. We want them moving. Getting the, the the getting the system moving because oftentimes they'll be depressed and they'll sit down and not do anything. So we actually put them on walking programs or, or cardiovascular programs to get them moving to avoid these problems. Yeah, I guess these are the these are the things which a lot of us don't talk much about. You know, in terms of an overlay of CRP is the what you talked about the cardiovascular program, the scapular positions during the rehab. I think these are very very untouched areas for many of us, uh, you know, for the overall outcome itself. Thank you so much for enlightening us on those things. And to end this webinar, I think we have something very interesting of the story of a mangled hand itself from day one to back to work. And I request specifically Hari to shoot that video for us. And Hari, over to you for that. <clears throat> Thank you, Anil. And I'm uh, Dr. Hari Venkatramni, working as a senior plastic and reconstructive surgery consultant at Ganga Hospital. So when Anil asked me to present uh, the story of a mangled hand, uh, he actually informed me one year in advance. But as always, though this patient came one in one year in advance, uh, it took uh, <coughs> a lot of effort to shoot the various part. So whenever we have a mangled extremity, so the, here is my patient. She's a 31-year-old mother of two, slipped from a two-wheeler and run over by a lorry. So she had mangled left upper extremity and lower extremity. In fact, she was referred to us for management of the lower extremity because the local treating surgeons did not realize the extent of upper limb injury. And that is one of the key. So if you concentrate on the upper limb here, this is what she has, she was having. So there is decloving of the skin and total disruption of the hand and the wrist. So basically, the hand was totally detached from the forearm and only attached to the remaining part with a sleeve of degloved skin. <clears throat> so this is how she presented to us. So when we analyze the x-ray, we work with close coordination with our orthopedic colleagues. <clears throat> we need to have stable skeletal fixation. So that was our aim. So complete plan is made at this stage. So now we realize that the hand is not attached to the forearm. It is totally decloved. There is no movement, sensation, or <clears throat> any capillary refilling seen in the <clears throat> fingertips. So that is the extent of degloving. The degloving extended right up to the distal arm. So here we make a complete plan. When we make a plan, what is our aim in such mangled extremity? So we will see that in the various steps. So we see the dorsal side. The dorsal skin was relatively better. So when we plan for our incision, we always prefer the volar incision because that gives us full access to the nerves, tendons and the vessels. And also the dorsal skin usually have some veins. So here we were very 
concerned about the venous drainage of this hand so we kept the entire veins preserved when we have tendons hanging out like this one of the small test as i just showed was just pull on the tendon if it is avulsed it just comes off in your hand don't leave avulsed tendon without bringing it out so once the tendons are totally withdrawn from the proximal site we assess the complete damage so here you see the dorsal skin is having the dorsal veins so it is very important to preserve them and then remove all the muscles which are hanging distally so proximal muscles you preserve as much as possible and do minimal trimming but all muscles which are attached to the distal tendon these muscles will not get revascularized and as sandeep mentioned one of the common cause of edema is leaving behind dead or uh, devitalized tissue so remove off all the muscles which are distally based as seen here so once you remove that you leave only tendons and try to preserve longer length of tendon because when we want to do a mass repair as we have done in this case mass repair of the flexor tendon and the extensor tendon it is nice to have longer length of tendon so after debridement you will be faced with three scenarios as seen in the picture a b or c a means the proximal muscle is not working and avulsed b is in this situation where the proximal muscles are good distal tendons are good but in between it is the mass is missing and c means the tendons are absent so after we have done the debridement you see the tendons are kept like that we go for distal plating so we do a distal plating shorten the bone by 11 cm in as seen here the advantage of shortening is we get primary repair of flexor tendons nerves and vessels so as much as possible we avoid long vein grafts and long nerve grafts in major mangled extremity if it is only one component involved we can still go for longer nerve graft or tendon graft but in this case all the three structures that is nerves vessels and tendons all needed to be primarily repaired so we were we shortened by 11 cm in upper extremity shortening of 11 cm as we will see subsequently does not cause as big functional or cosmetic dis, uh, disfigurement and it is key to have stable fixation and we have come to a realization now with more than 100 wrist fixations in primary mangled extremity that this is the best form of stable fixation as compared to external fixator because it aids subsequent reconstruction and early mobilization so having done a primary repair of all the flexors extensors and the nerves we use the fds which is on the superficial side to cover so the fds basically covers the flexor tendon so you are left with a wound like this where if even the skin has any problem in healing we can go for skin graft and that's exactly what happened so we wait patiently for a period of 5 to 6 days as seen in this picture most of the dorsal skin survived the edges necrosed so we wait for it to completely demarcate once the demarcation has happened we just excise the area and cover with skin graft we did not go for primary flap cover because as you see the wound was not at that stage ready so at 3 months first we fit with the processes because that is very psychologically important for the patient and for mobilization so at 3 months we reach a stage as seen here the bone is started uniting and that's the amount of forearm shortening which is seen unless you compare both upper extremities like this you cannot make out the difference because when the elbow is flexed the shortening is not noticeable so we reach a stage like this and then we start really aggressive physiotherapy so physiotherapy starts around the time where we achieve some amount of bony stability so this is early range of movement and at 6 months we will find in the subsequent video that she has got significant improvement in the range of movement so that's a flexion and that's extensions this is just achieved by weaving the avulsed tendon into the proximal muscle so this is a type of physiotherapy she was undergoing for the first 6 months so you see here that's the our physiotherapist senior physiotherapist gopinath is really bringing the fingers out because most of these patients will have strong finger flexors but weaker finger extensors and then 
concentrate on the elbow range of movement because having kept the elbow in a splint for significant period of time it can go for uh, stiffness so that's the amount of power she can generate because we have shortened there is no slack in the tendon so tendons are really in in good uh, uh, in the uh, it is not uh, loose or slackened so then we start on activities of daily living so this is the adl activity training which is going on we make the patients also buy one kit as we have in the physiotherapy department so that they can do the same thing at home so this stage we reach at one year so at one year we have reached this stage and this is at our house she lives around 400 kilometers from our center at this stage now we can plan for cosmetic correction of these scars as you see this there is lot of overhanging extensor side skin available and that's what we did very recently so i have not included in this video but we can do a refashioning of the scar and also use that extra skin to cover the volar side she is back to work she is back to taking care of her two kids she is functional in most of our activity of daily living so still what she lacks is a intrinsic recovery which will take some more time and if it does not recur then we will plan for some subsequent tendon transfers because we have fused the wrist we have some amount of wrist extensors available proximally which we can use with as sandeep showed with facial autographs she is able to manage most of her out household activities like cooking and uh, taking care of her children and sending them then off to school so before they reach a stage like this they should have some amount of protective sensation her 2 pd is though still between 12 to 15 but then she is able to uh, feel hot and cold and she is also able to uh, use her hand for most of the activities of uh, daily living this is her sending her daughter to school and that's her son going off to school she does not have any house help so she this is at 14 months follow up very recent just taken 10 days back <clears throat> so that's her back to her family so the success of uh this case or uh, any mangled is going back to the society and back to her life so if you see the dash score it is 5 so the take home messages in uh, this mangled extremity uh, injury is that they are all received as sandeep mentioned and seen by the senior most uh, member of the team so the decisions can be made quickly arrival to the hospital to on table should be as short as possible in her case it was 15 minutes so as soon as she comes all patients are received in the ante room of the operation theater so in 10 minutes time she is intubated and put on table so that we have as low ischemia time as possible in her case the ischemia time was 5 and 1/2 hours assessment of wound is done under anesthesia most of our mangled extremities are done under regional anesthesia but in her case because she had uh, she came in shock and had lower extremity involved so she was <coughs> intubated and we did it under general anesthesia after the debride one we make a complete plan our aim in a mangled extremity is to have stable bony union so you should have a stable skeleton finger flexors as much as possible good sensation and a good soft tissue cover if you are able to achieve these four simple but very difficult goals it is always better than any available processes currently so we prefer to do bone shortening as much as required and rigid internal fixation so this we find is far superior to having a temporary external fixator because it is not stable enough to do any subsequent reconstruction and to start early mobilization aim for good sensation and intrinsic recovery so we usually wait for intrinsic recovery before we go for a free functioning muscle transfer or any other secondary reconstruction for the flexor or extensor uh, reconstruction early supervised physiotherapy as early as 4 weeks is ideal so we start them early and then we continue the physiotherapy at the local place 
now with online zoom as well as whatsapp we are able to monitor them even as in her case she is from 500 kilometers from our place so we can monitor her on monthly basis secondary soft tissue procedures we prefer to do as in her case now we have started excising the scar and using that excessive skin to redrape onto the uh, volar side only after the there is complete bony union so thank you very much thank you thank you hari for taking us through that uh, inspiring journey as such uh, i think we we had a very wonderful uh, sequence of this entire uh, uh, angle hand uh, treatment strategies and management uh, one last question to my faculty what would be your one one important take home message for mangle hand management if each one of you can tell me one message uh, starting off with safa safa okay sandeep yeah okay we'll start yeah yeah sandeep but, uh, please i think i just stick to what i said get the senior person to come okay for the for a mangled injury let the senior person should be there for the first stop and the assessment that's when the plan is made and you you already have a picture in your mind as to what what it is going to be like at one year from now and so you work towards that plan you've talked to the patient their relatives and i think it's important for the senior person to be there at the first the first time you talk and that instills confidence in the patient also they know that you you know what you are talking about and we can both work towards getting there right i mean i think that that's a very very valid point uh, dr pitts from your side yeah i i that that's that a great question i i think that um my experience tells me that that team communication uh open communication team communication and expectations try to lay out expectations and timelines to the patient right. it helps them understand big picture what's going on and talk about how the case is progressing and where you want to go and what the timeline is it helps reassure them and helps them psychologically as well as physically um combat the the problem their loss of social roles when they can go back to their ADLs when they can go back to their 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 a uh, modified work their essential job tasks when they could go have a good time when they could be with their family when they could play with their kids those timelines are extremely important psychologically to the patient and it assures them that that there is hope uh, that 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 we're going to we're going to get through this together and so it's a teamwork uh, with the with the doctor with the patient and the therapist and the family members all working together uh, to to realize a good functional outcome very 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 <coughs> nicely said i think that that's very very important in the background hari what's your thoughts i think the both sandeep and uh, don put it very beautifully so we just need to uh, our philosophy is it should be better than a processes which most of the cases as i mentioned is better second is if the hand is structurally good distal to the wrist and proximal however maybe the injury as i showed you should go all out and try to save it we can always make a functional hand with lot of secondary procedures now in our armamentarium and on day 1 it is very important to mix uh, or t- when you speak to the patient and the relatives to have like dr sabapati our mentor says have truth with sympathy so tell them the truth but always be sympathetic if you tell them this will never function it will be like a like a many people say like paper weight or something like that so then it is not right so you need to give them the correct expectation i always tell the patients and the relatives three things are very important unlimited time on both parts unlimited uh, patience and in our case unlimited resources also funding funding is important and then unlimited faith in the treating team so i think if these three uh, fundamentally are are there then we can go ahead and do all out for you so giving the correct timeline giving the number of procedures and mixing truth with sympathy is very important they look into your eyes and they know if they will they will be fine or not so you need to have that that picture what they will have is actually seen they seen in your eyes so as a treating team 
you need to be uh, united in uh, your approach to what you can achieve and what you can deliver yeah i, I think it's very very important uh, in, to be you know uh, very uh, compassionate to what uh, they expect and you know stay with them till till the end of the journey i think as surgeons we talked about uh, you know on our evil blogs uh, skeletal stabilization all those things but what we don't talk much about is patient motivation the psychological you know make up and the family support and the resources so it's it's obviously it's it's uneven out there it's it's not nobody i mean not everybody gets the equal kind of opportunities for these kind of mangled hands and i think uh, as surgeons we need to be much more than that it can't be just limiting ourselves to surgeons or therapists we need to be a part of their journey at least at least for some time at least till we don't know what is the end point a lot of time we define the end points ourselves and stop at that we create the boundaries for these patients but i think if you stay with them for a longer time i guess they do they most of them do very well i think that's the, that's the message of this entire thing not to give up on these mangled hands and thank you so much my faculty for this and i really appreciate all your efforts in putting up this uh, i know how much of efforts have gone to you know create these uh, talks i really appreciate that i really also appreciate that the supporting team mckenzie abigail the ortho tv and of course finally the evo uh, hand education committee itself for this wonderful opportunity i think we end this webinar with this a very positive note on these uh, condition of the mangled hand thank you everyone have a great day yeah and a good night thank you thank you